the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there will be a group from my Ummah who will enter Jannah. They are 70,000 in number. Their faces will illuminate on the Day of Judgment like the luminosity of the moon when it is full. We ask Allah to make us amongst them. Who are those 70,000? There is another hadith the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the nations were presented to me. How and when did he see this? Was it during the Isra wal Mi'raj trip? Was it a dream that he saw? Allah knows best. What did he see? I saw a prophet and with him was a few people. And I saw a prophet with one or two people alongside of him. And I saw prophets and they were standing all by themselves. Imagine a prophet sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a community to give them da'wah, aided with wahi, connected to the heavens, communicating with angels. And not a single person accepts his da'wah. He comes on the day of judgment with zero followers. What happened next? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when all of a sudden I saw a huge crowd and my assumption was that these were my ummah. And it was said to me, no, that's Prophet Musa and his people. Then it was said to me, look into the horizon. I looked into the horizon. I saw another huge gathering. Then it was said to me, look to the other horizon. I looked, he said, another huge gathering. And it was said to me, that is your ummah. And amongst them, will be 70,000 Muslims whom Allah will allow to enter Jannah without any prior accountability or suffering. Imagine, imagine all of the difficulties you have read and heard about, about the day of judgment, the horrors of that day, the length of that day, the sweating of that, the darkness of that day, the fear. They are spared of it all and they have almost a backdoor entrance into Jannah. And so the immediate reaction is, and I'm sure you are probably thinking this, is that these are very few in number. What is 70,000? I mean, that's all of Muslims since Adam alayhi salam till the last man. This concerned our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In another narration I want to share with you, he said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, my Lord promised me that he will allow 70,000 people from my ummah to enter Jannah without any prior suffering or punishment. And with every 1,000 of them is another 70,000. With every 1,000 from the 70,000 is another 70,000. So how many? Four million? Nine? 900,000. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and on top of that, Allah has promised me three handfuls from the handfuls of my Lord, three scoops from the scoops of my Lord. We ask Allah to make us from that scoop. Umar radiallahu anhu, when he heard this, he said, Allahu Akbar. He understood what this means. There is a huge hope. And meanwhile, our messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went back into his home. He didn't tell them who these 70,000 are going to be. So the Sahaba began to speak. Who are they? Some of the Sahaba said, maybe they are the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other Sahaba said, perhaps they were those who were born Muslims. And so they never engaged in paganism, idolatry. And they mentioned other opinions. Then the Prophet ﷺ came out. He said to them, what are you discussing? They said, we're discussing the 70,000 you spoke about, the Messenger of Allah. And then now he tells them who they are. Listen carefully. This is an open opportunity for all of us. He said, They are those who do not request ruqya. They don't cauterize themselves. They don't follow bad omens. And upon their Lord, they rely. These are the people whom Allah will give access to Jannah with no suffering, no pain, and no questioning before the King subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are they? He said, they don't seek ruqya. Ruqya meaning the Islamic way of curing or the Islamic option of curing someone who is ill by reciting something from the Quran or authentic from the Sunnah. And by the way, this isn't to be understood that you should avoid ruqya. No, ruqya is a Sunnah. And you should offer people ruqya and you should do ruqya on someone. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when offered ruqya, he accepted it. The hadith here is speaking about a very high category of people. They don't request it. They accept it if given, if administered, but they don't ask for it because their reliance upon Allah is so strong. Who was the second category? They don't brand themselves. They don't cauterize themselves. Cauterization is a traditional way of healing the sick by the permission of Allah, which involves using fire or heated items, and it causes excruciating amounts of pain. And so our Prophet ﷺ disliked it. He said they don't engage in iktiwa, cauterization. Number three, they don't follow negative omens, meaning they don't believe in luck. 
there's no such thing as a negative number, a bad number, a bad sign. And the Arabs, what they would do previously, this is a pagan custom where they would take a bird and they're about to engage in an endeavor. They don't know, should I, should I not? So they release the bird. If it takes one direction, they see it as a good omen. If it takes a different direction, they see it as a bad omen. And that's baseless. And we have in our horoscopes today, unfortunately, many equivalents. This is your sign. This is your good fortune, a sign of bad fortune. You walk under a ladder, be careful. I think you're gonna have a bad day. No, we don't do that stuff. He said, They don't follow bad omens. And then he said, and They place their trust in Allah. That is the summary of these people. They place their reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are people of tawakkul upon their Lord. And so a sahabi by the name of Ukasha ibn Mihsan, he stood up when he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying this. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, please pray to Allah that he makes me one of these people. He said, Anta minhum, you are one of them. So a second Sahabi stood up and he said, Me too, Messenger of Allah, make God that Allah makes me one of them. And he said, O oh, I beat you to it. Some opportunities in life present themselves once. Reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is an action of the heart. Where a Muslim truly realizes that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is in control of the universe. So the heart settles and all pessimism and anxieties and illusion and paranoia and OCD is flushed out because you've realized that Allah is the most mighty and upon him reliance should be placed. What is tawakkul? Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali is a tawakkul, reliance upon Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is a state of the heart when it truly relies upon Allah in reaping the good it wants or repelling evil with respect to matters of deen and dunya. Any good that you want, any evil you want to repel, pertaining to dunya or the hereafter, when you do that, i.e. you say, Ya Rabb, I trust that you will help me fulfill it, you are a Muslim who has exercised tawakkul. A second definition was given by Al-Jurjani. He said that tawakkul is a state of confidence in what Allah possesses. And it's when you give up hope in the possessions of people. It is a state of confidence in what Allah possesses. And it is a state of despair, giving up, looking past what people possess. And you realize that the fears that you have and the needs that you have, Allah is more aware of your needs than you are of yourself. And Allah's ability of fulfilling those needs of yours is greater than your ability is in fulfilling them. And Allah's desire in wanting good for you is greater than your desire is than what you want for yourself. You realize as a Muslim who has relied upon Allah that sovereignty is His, kingdom is His, control is His, the decision is His, power is His. When He wills a matter to be, it has to happen. No one can stand in the way. And when Allah says, no, this will not happen, no one can make it happen. A Muslim who realizes all of this, what happens? His heart settles at the Bay of Tawakkul, not looking past its Lord. When wanting to fulfill a matter of dunya, or a matter of the religion. This is Tawakkul.